Okay, folks, I think we were meant to start. I'm pleased to say that this week the technology is with us. Uh, that's what you know that we have very friendly. But anyway, it's, it's great to be with you. This is the fourth and the final of our seminars. This is a joint production, as I said, between the Opera Centre for Religion and Culture and the Dialogue Society. We had a book launch of Paul Wells. Two books of which I neglect to bring them with me back to wave around, but they are still very, very good books. I mean, they have not finished from last week to this week, so they're still worth buying. And we still have flies that enable you to do so at a discount, I think, within the month or something like that. Um, also, I think to remind those of you who are joining us remotely that if you could keep your microphone muted, please. Anyway. So without further ado, I will hand over to my colleague, Professor Paul Weller, who is the Associate Director and an Associate Director of the Centre, who has been the brains behind this whole event. So Paul. Okay, thank you very much, Anthony, and uh, a very warm welcome uh, to Rabbi Jacqueline Tabby. Um, it's an immense pleasure to be able to welcome you here. Um, we've been collaborating in a project um, for a, a little while, albeit remotely, as has been everybody's won't during the uh, uh, COVID season. And so it's actually really nice to be able to sit down. Yes, yes, exactly. So thank you very much for being willing to come. And having also uh, struggled through, unfortunately, uh, transport difficulties from London with uh, underground strikes and so on. So we're really very grateful to have you here. Um, uh, Rabbi Jackie was, I believe, uh, the first reform woman rabbi ordained in, in the UK. Um, and I was just pointing out on the wall of the college here, the room here, we have uh, a portrait actually of the uh, first Baptist woman minister who graduated here in, in Oxford, um, uh, Reverend uh, Hedger. So, um, so we're in good company here, um, interreligiously or cross-religiously. And of course, our theme, our overall theme, is interreligious and interconvictional dialogue. And we have had so far um, introductions around perspectives on uh, Muslims and dialogue, humanists and dialogue, uh, Christians and dialogue. And this week, uh, Rabbi Jackie is going to open up for us the theme of Jews and dialogue. So. We place ourselves in your hands, we look forward very much to your input, and then to some discussion, questions, and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a lovely place to come to. I could have sat quietly in that <laughs> for a long time. It's very beautiful out there. Um, it would seem to me that, of course, the world is in increasing dialogue between religions. As Hans Kung, a Swiss Catholic priest once famously wrote in 1995, no peace among the nations without peace among the religions, no peace among the religions without dialogue between the religions, no dialogue between the religions without investigation of the foundation of the religions. And looking around the world today, there can be no doubt in my mind of the need for dialogue between religious groups. In so many ways, the global village has become a reality. We strike up email and social media friendships across the world, especially these last two and a half years. I can see and speak to our son in New York through the wonders of Zoom. Stopped lack of true communication with other peoples, bringing inevitable mistrust tragedy and violence in its wake. Indeed, social media is so full of hatred. In this so small world of ours, hatred between religious groups keeps erupting. And I believe Hans Kuhn is right. Dialogue can help ameliorate the problem. But of course, first one has to try and define what is meant by dialogue. And one soon realizes that there are many different 
There is first what we might call the have a cup of tea variety. Very popular and useful because it is normally totally non-threatening. It's an activity that has occupied much of my life as a rabbi over the years. I have visited countless schools and groups in churches and talked about some aspect of Jewish life. I've even held demonstrations, demonstration Seder meals, but I was always keen to tell them that contrary to uh, common belief, Jesus would not have been involved in such a ritual as so many aspects of the Seder developed after the second century. Many groups have visited synagogues that I've served in over the years, had a tour or a group, and then been treated to light refreshments. And interestingly, while most synagogues seem open to see visitors, very few arrange for return visits. As the minority religion, I think many Jews feel they glean enough, certainly about Christianity, in school or on TV, or now social media, they don't feel they need the visits to such an extent. These sort of interactions are the simplest form of dialogue. And as I said, they serve a useful purpose in demonstrating that we Jews do not have horns or tails, and sometimes, happily, individuals in the different groups develop personal relationships. For many years, I was part of the chaplaincy team at a local hospice. During that time, the Christian chaplain, who had problems with the group at that point, came to the synagogue for various festivities, and I took part in Christmas gatherings, presenting a Jewish touch. The most wonderful thing that arose from this casual relationship was that when he was in a civil service, he and his wife asked me to do the religious on this. <coughs> and we wove together some Jewish traditions with other folk traditions and prayers that they'd chosen. And I felt very honored. One wonderful event happened before a Shabbat morning service many years ago, illustrating a simple act of dialogue. That morning, I came to the service and found a Muslim family, obviously from the Gulf. The husband Explained that his wife had experienced many miscarriages and had come to London for specialist medical help. She'd stayed nearby in bed for eight months and hearing the music coming from the synagogue had found that if a child was born alive, she would come to give thanks. So I blessed this beautiful baby, naming him Muhammad in front of our open bar. I often wonder if they shared the interfaith nature of the blessing with their son as he grew, and whether that story helped him to view Jews and Judaism in a more positive light. So most Jews are, in fact, open to such superficial social and religious interactions. And in general, it is a chance to be really lovely people. Religious bigots are not usually attracted to helpful. They can even be taken to a slightly deeper level of discussion. When I was serving in Weybridge, in Surrey, my synagogue was the host for several Holocaust memorial events in January, inviting people from local churches and schools to give presentations on the theme, whatever it was that year, and, and representing, of course, the, the dangers of genocide across lots of different cultures. We all held interfaith evenings when we invited local clergy to come and share an aspect of their faith with us. Though sometimes things can go wrong. At one of the Holocaust Memorial events, Local Baptist minister, I'm afraid, uh, clearly told us that we should Christianity. And on one interfaith event, um, the deacon from the Guildford Cathedral, responsible for interfaith dialogue, came and told me that as a modern woman, I fully understand 
how the world would be a much better place if we could forget religious differences and all worship Jesus. <laughs> well, today, yes, it happens. It's my honor to look at the possibility of dialogue. <laughs> um, and those last two stories illustrate why for some Jews, interfaith dialogue on a deeper level is seen as dangerous. On too many occasions in the past, so-called dialogue has been used as an excuse to attempt to convert us Jews to the dominant religion, usually Christianity in this case. You may have heard, for example, of the very famous disputation of Barcelona in the 13th century between a Dominican friar, Pablo Cristiani, a convert from Judaism, and Nachmanides, also called the Ramban, who was a leading Jewish scholar, philosopher, doctor, mystic, and biblical commentator. They had a debate on whether or not Jesus was the Messiah. It was held in the royal court of King James I of Aragon, in the presence of the king, his court prominent and knights. It was generally agreed that Ramban had actually won the argument, but that didn't stop him having to go into exile, nor troubles being visited on the local Jewish community. And that disputation was only one of many such events stretching through the centuries. In fact, my friends at school were involved in such an endeavor. I was the only Jewish girl in my school, in my year, of oh, 93 kids in a year at a grammar school that I went to in Woodland. And I loved our head teacher. But when she retired, and the number of Jewish girls in each year jumped to around 40, I realized that she had been running an unofficial, unofficial quota system. Apart from always having to answer basic questions about Judaism, the big test came for me when my churchgoers, one of the things that kept us together, we were all interested in religion and God, but they became involved in the Billy Graham crusades. <laughs> Another, is he another man? He's about to right. Well, I don't know that he is. <laughs> okay. They left out leaflets for me on my desk. I was at this point in the upper six. One friend, and she is still a friend, and I please interact, told me that because I'm such a good person, maybe Jesus would open the door of heaven a crack for me so I could enter. I went to one of the crusade meetings to pacify my friend, and I was interested in it. But as you can hear and see, I was left untouched by the experience. So many Jews tend to be wary of holy children to such discussions. In Islam, as acknowledged monotheists, we may have a lower status in some areas officially at Dimi, but we are not usually exposed to concerted attempts to convert us. Of course, to me, and I hope to you sitting here, true dialogue does not have that aim. Rather, it is, as far as I'm concerned, the opening of a conversation between two or more groups of people who regard each other as equal partners in the hope that we can learn from each other and, if necessary, revise any previous held prejudices that may have existed in our minds, and which are in faith. But then another danger, of course, presents itself. Does such dialogue challenge the religious identity of the partners? After all, if I engage in such a dialogue and am truly open to what I'm told, and then afterwards assert the equal religious validity of the other person's faith to God, 
then how can I say to Jewish people that I teach, especially to the young, that Judaism is the way that they should go? The bit of attention. Again, it is that conundrum that dissuades many Jews from partaking in such discussions. But of course, as in all religious discussions, traditions, there are many different types of Jews. I'm here before you as a Jew that hails from the more progressive wing of Judaism. The way I interpret texts will differ with my co-religionists and affect how we treat each other and the other. I believe that the core of our traditional Torah and the accompanying oral Torah were developed over hundreds of years by groups of men. And of course, I use that word advisedly. And that the texts we treasure relate to the social conditions of their time. But I also believe in a divine element in those texts. After all, the people concerned were involved in a spiritual search. And I'm also conscious that the texts have been at the core of our being for over two and a half thousand years. So I don't take them lightly. On the other hand, my approach to those texts is bound to be different from those who believe that they all come directly from the mouth of God, and that therefore they can additional rules. In that view of Jewish sacred texts. I'd like to base what I have to say now on two texts that I feel are vital in this discussion. The first text comes from a body of writing called the Tsefta, which is a compilation of Jewish oral law from the late second century of the common era. Though of course, probably come from earlier, it's just that that's when they were written down. Because you know, when you have an oral tradition, who knows when they actually were said, right? And uh, we have a son who's doing a PhD in Talmud at the moment, and he tells me all my historical facts are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I say these things with trepidation. <laughs> um, but it's an important um, supplement to a book of oral law, which we call the Mishnah. There you can find the teaching. The righteous people of all nations have a share in the world to come. That is, in broad terms, someone does not have to be Jewish to go to heaven after death. I don't need to keep doors open and crap for my friends or my enemies. I certainly do not need to assume a policy of trying to convert everyone that I have a religious dialogue with to Judaism. Second text I'm going to introduce much later, toward the end of the lecture. Now it's true that in the intertestamental and early rabbinic period, there were several examples of mass forced conversion to Jews. The traumatic results which followed in some of these events helped underpin the somewhat ambivalent nature of later rabbinic responses to the phenomenon of conversion to Judaism and the way converts were to be treated, and indeed the numbers who wanted to join us. From self-rule under Hasmonean dynasty, the Jewish people at that period endured the violence of Roman life and the destruction of the Second Temple and exile with all the changes that you can imagine that brought to religious life. The other main problem affected conversion was that Judaism as a faith was essentially different from the Greco-Roman religions. In the classical world, religions, I see that told by Margaret Armstrong, who's a, a great figure in this, are centered mainly on mystical myths, not dogma. Conquered people were encouraged to add elements of the conqueror's faith onto their own, 
such as the erection of a Roman idol in the temple. But Judaism and later Christianity was different to those cults, and that each of them saw God as wanting their adherents to be exclusively gods with no element of syncretism allowed. This very different approach to religion meant that Judaism came to be seen as a threat. For example, Jewish missionary activity in Rome was punished by expulsion from the city several times in the second century um, of the Common Era. In addition, the imperial Christianity in the West, and at the end of the period, Islam in the East, resulted in often restrictions being placed on Jewish communities. It became dangerous to accept converts. In 315, Constantine forbade conversions, and again, um, the church forbade missionary activity by Jews on pain of death. The ambivalence in the text that arose from these historical trends has resulted in very different interpretations of the attitude of rabbis towards converts as portrayed in modern sources. So you have someone called Bamberg who wrote that the leaders of the Jewish people were eager to make converts, were highly successful in winning them, and where some more noticed a less inviting uh, social equality, uh, sorry, a no, less inviting approach amongst the rabbis. Equality in law and religion does not necessarily carry with it equality, he said. And Jews would have been singularly unlike the rest of humanity if they felt no superiority to their heathen converts. Oh, the convert simultaneously joined both the religion and the people. This factor may have limited Judaism's success in attracting converts, since they were expected to join themselves to the entirety of a cultural system. Judaism was relatively less successful than either Christianity or Islam, due to both its demands on its converts, especially in the early period of Christianity, uh, one thinks about the uh, circumcision and uh, the laws of Kashrut Da'al of eating. Here in generating or joining a powerful imperium. So Judaism was definitely not a mission religion once the first, second century was over, in that it had no trained professionals or volunteers who set out with the aim of winning converts. But it seems rabbis were open to possibility. Um, in the Roman period, um, as I've said, converts were actively sought, and I don't need to quote to Christians here in the room from the book of Matthew, where it says, alas for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you who travel over sea and land to make a single proselyte. Um, so obviously it was happening in that period, yes. <laughs> in the Hasmonean period, uh, two major groups, as I said, were converted to Judaism the Idumeans and the Eturians. Neither conversion was a success. Herod came from Idumean stock. His reign was a disaster for Jewish people. The Eturians never really integrated. And on the other hand, though, there were individual conversions that were quite common, apparently. Josephus notes that Herod Agrippa's sister did not want to marry an Arabian nobleman who refused circumcision. And Agrippa II's sister, Berenice, only married the king of Sicilia after he had converted. So it was happening. Even under the Romans, Josephus noted, a widespread interest in Judaism that could be exploited. He wrote, the masses have long since shown a keen desire to adopt our religious observances. And there is not one city, Greek or barbarian, nor a single nation 
to which our custom of abstaining from work on the seventh day has not spread, and where fasts and lighting of lamps and many of our prohibitions in the matter of food are not observed. We also hear from Josephus of the conversion of a kingdom called Adiabene, which was found between the Caspian Sea and Antioch, Antioch a little south of Armenia. The queen of the country, Helen, and her son, Isaurus, both learned separately of Judaism from merchants, both converted, and they fought with the Jews against Rome. The kingdom was defeated by Trajan and disappeared from history. There was probably the conversion of Pelagius in Ethiopia, and there were some stories from both Christian and Arabic sources of the people of Dunawas in southern Arabia becoming Jewish. But the stories are complicated, contradictory, and could have been that it was actually a desire to escape domination by a local people in the period that drove these conversions rather than the notion of the Jewish faith being attracted. We just don't know. There's no proof um, that these conversions actually took place, but we do know that certain Jewish ideas became widespread in the years before Muhammad's army swept through the region of that uh, southern Arabia and then up into the Mediterranean. On balance, proselytes were seen as an advantage to the Jewish people. There was a prayer composed and placed within the standing prayer, which is the main prayer that we still recite today, which prays for the welfare of the Gary Tzedek, the righteous converts. Um, it doesn't ask us to convert people, but if people have converted, we ask for God to bless them. Um, and there are many positive statements uh, that abound. But what does become evident, both because of the social and political dangers of accepting converts, conversion to Judaism was not prioritized. And indeed, the comment from the Tosefta became very important to us. We didn't have to seek the conversion of others, even if they were our friends, because righteous people have a, an entry ticket to, to heaven. Under such a theological stance, dialogue is actually much easier to facilitate. But who are the righteous, you might ask? There's different definitions of this. And then to reflect the willingness or not to engage in discussion with peoples of other faith. So in the Mishnah, which was written about the same time as the sector, by the end of the second century, a different picture emerges, more restrictive of those who can get to the world of kind. But the restrictions are on Jewish people who don't hold the right views. So if you are uh, Jewish and don't believe in the resurrection of the dead or the divine authorship of the Torah, then you can't get into heaven, apparently, according to the Mishnah. But this was probably part of the battle between two political groups of Judaism called the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and nothing to do with the relationships with the outside world. Many define the righteous who can enter heaven in terms of the deceptor under, as long as people keep what are known as the seven laws of Noah. Now, um, Noahide laws aren't explicitly mentioned in the Torah, but they were extrapolated from the book of Genesis by second century rabbis. In Genesis, God speaks to Noah after his children uh, exit the ark and said, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with all your seed after you. And the rabbis defined the laws as establish law courts, don't curse God, don't practice idolatry, don't engage in illicit sex, don't participate in bloodshed, don't rob people and don't eat flesh from a living animal. Yes, you're not allowed to 
like they do in the bay in Dublin. They cut off the legs of, of um, crabs and then throw them back into the water to so them grow in more. And of course, in terms of dialogue, it's the, the third teaching um, that's the most difficult because what's meant by idolatry? Yeah. And also, what do you mean by blasphemy? Um, the, in theory, though, these laws can be applied in a universal manner. It seems that originally, of course, uh, Jews had in mind actually Christians and Muslims when they considered the righteous. Yes, they didn't know much about Hinduism or Buddhism or those sorts of religions. Um, though it does, 13th century, they had come across Hinduism and Buddhism, and there were many who said, no, they can't enter heaven because they are idolatrous religions. Um, and this is causing problems. In the modern period, you begin to get uh, some rabbis who suggest that, in fact, that it is not um, an idolatrous religion, Hinduism or Buddhism, that behind them there is a notion of a one God that they understand being um, explored through the various uh, manifestations of those gods in the idols. And so you get people um, like uh, Martin Buber, who was able to look at that uh, religions and learn from them in terms of meditative technique. A great, a great uh, teacher he was. But, of course, as Jews, we always have arguments, you know, you, you may know the saying, uh, 10 Jews, at least 12 synagogues. So you, you can't all go to the same one. Um, there was, um, in the Lubavitch world, you may know about Chabad and Lubavitch world, um, their teacher, Menachem Mendel Chiesman, who died a few years ago now, but they haven't really placed it yet. Um, she uh, didn't want to convert everyone to Judaism, of course, but <coughs> did see it as his duty to try and bring everybody to obey the seven Noahide laws. And in fact, there was a call in uh, 2016, as modern as that, uh, by a Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel called Yitzhak Yoka, who said, I don't know where he got it from. According to Judaism, he said, no who's not either a Jew or a believer in the Noahide laws. No idea where he got that from, but he's been teaching it. Uh, and it was rather shocking and offensive to many of us. And this, um, of course, is also tangential this whole business of the Noahide laws um, with a, a concept that might be difficult for people in terms of dialogue, and that is of the notion of chosen people. Because for some Jews, it is absolutely true that they do believe in such statements that come from Torah that say, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his dreaded prophet. And you get people from poets like Yehuda Levi, right through and especially into some of the uh, right-wing uh, mystical groups, which will say that even someone who converts to Judaism, their soul will never reach the level of a Jewish soul. But they are the minority. Most people understand um, that um, there is um, that the idea of the chosen people is very much that God has chosen us to keep his Torah. And that unless somebody I don't think I want to convert, so I'll tell them that. Um, but unless they, um, you know, the, the, the notion is keeping the Torah um, is what we've chosen to do. And it's not that it makes us better than anyone else, it's just our job, you know. And that's what most Jews actually believe. 
Now, I remember, and some of you may remember a few years ago, the great joy uh, when um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs published a book called The Dignity of Difference. Yes? So you know the big arguments between the first and the second edition. Yes? Right. The first spoken to mankind in many languages, Judaism to Jews, Christianity to Christians, Islam to Muslims, God is the God of all humanity, but no single faith is or should be the faith of all humanity. We got it in the neck of right-wing Jews to such an extent that he recanted and gave out a second edition of the book. Yes, I have both in my house. Um, yes, to the dismay of many said, God communicates in human language, but there are dimensions of the divine that must forever elude us. As Jews, we believe that God has made a covenant with singular people, but that does not exclude the possibility of other people's cultures and faiths finding their own relationship with God. Notice the last bit within the shared frame of the lower five laws. So, to my second and last text that I wanted to share with you, and that's one that you all, I'm sure, are familiar with, uh, where it says in the book of Genesis that God said, Let us make humanity in our likeness. That, to me, speaks of all humanity, not just Jews. The Jewish Bible contains many stories, books even, about non Jews. The book of Jonah, the book of Job, there's lovely stuff there from non Jews. In Amos, the prophet Amos, uh, it says, To me, O Israel, you are just like the Ethiopians, declares the Lord God. In rabbinic writings, Rabbi Akiva wrote, Beloved as human being, and that he was created in thy image. Even greater love was shown to, it, to them in that it was made known to them that humans, not Jews, humans were created in the image. As it said, in the image of God was the human made. All of us created in the image of God. All of us have a special uh, ways of our own to approach God. True, we believe that Israel has a special close relationship to God. But as my colleague and teacher that I've worked with for many years, Rabbi Green once said, quoting what he said was a Yiddish proverb, just because you love your grandmother doesn't mean you can't equally love your grandfather. <laughs> so, you know, God can love us and God can love everybody else too, because God is great. Um, so we are taught, of course, that only one human being taught in rabbinic literature from the second third century. One human being was created in the world in order to create harmony amongst humans. No one should say, my ancestor is better than yours. Um, so there is within Judaism this possibility of understanding that yes, we may have a special relationship with God, but then other people do. Yes, people can convert to Judaism and they're very welcome, but we're not going out to find people. In fact, we put barriers in the way, making sure they understand the problems of conversion um, because it's not easy. And yes, um, of course, um, we're all made in the image of God. And that therefore, we have this connection uh, there was a, a wonderful rabbi called David Zeller, who uh, unfortunately now has died. He described the spiritual process of religion as an inward journey to seek the oneness of life and soul that we knew in the Garden of Eden. And that's before Jesus. Before we ate the true knowledge. He taught that because we gained some knowledge of Material scientific world, we forgot that the world is one and God is one. We maintain that the Garden of Eden still exists in our world, but we can no longer see it 
because we have this tendency to split everything up. I always think of the example of medicine these days, where you know you get a doctor whose specialism is one's left toe, and they don't notice the rest of a human being. But we need to break through those limits and put have humility so that we can change the way we relate to other people and have dialogue. And this to me is, of course, related to the teachings of the environmentalists. And uh, one of the things that I am actually is president of the World Congress of Faith, mm -hmm. a venerable, uh, old 1936 was founded. And there, the founder of the uh, World Congress of Faith introduced to Eastern mysticism in the mountains of Tibet, taught that there is a oneness behind creation. We don't have to all worship God the same way. We all have our own ways of doing it, but there is a oneness in the world. That, to me, is something that Judaism has very much taught us. Certainly, the understanding and interaction between people of different faith communities is important for healing suspicions, for forging strong bonds of community, and generating a renewed spiritual vision of justice and peace in our society. As I said, boy, do we need it. Thank you very much.